Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here, and we are so glad that you are joining us in worship today. Today we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion, so I invite you to take this time to go and get any sort of bread and liquid of your choice, whether that's your morning cup of coffee and a bagel or juice and crackers with your kids, whatever that is, we'd love for you to take a second and gather those elements so that you are ready when we come to celebrate communion together. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, would you join me in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for gathering us together today. Thank you that you are beyond the bounds of space and time, and so you are able to create communion with each other and with you, even as we are online. God, I ask that you would transform us in this time. Would you open our ears to hear your word? Open our hearts to receive your love. And as we leave this place, would you open our hands in service to your world? We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. comes the nation rejoices open the gates before him lift up your voices who is the king of glory how shall we call him he is Emmanuel the promised of ages the king of glory comes the nation rejoices open the gates before him lift up your voices The nation rejoices, open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Sing then of David's son, our Savior and brother, in all of Galilee was never another. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices, open the gates before him, lift up your voices. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom he will establish and uphold it, with justice and with the righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus. Our hope and joy, O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel.
Good morning to the Vine online worshipers here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I attended a meeting about six weeks ago to participate in a discussion concerning the cash flow shortfall facing our church this year. As the meeting was ending, I looked at Pastor Doug and said, I'll speak to the congregation if you need me to. Wait, what? This is the girl who has a brownie couldn't even ask someone to buy a box of Girl Scout Thin Mint cookies. What happened after that meeting? It wasn't a God wink or a God nudge or a God push. This was a God in your face shove. If you've been watching our worship services over the past month or so, you've heard from two amazing financially astute gentlemen from our congregation regarding our budget. Today, you're listening to me, Donna Hudson, a person whose only qualification to speak is my love for this church and its people and what we do as a congregation. This church is so special to me, to you, to all of us. Let me tell you about some of the programs that are so close to my heart and to yours, I suspect. First, outreach. I'm the chairperson of the outreach committee. Through your generous giving, this committee's budget supports food insecurity programs such as Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, and Weekend Meals on Wheels, and Nourish NC. We support sheltering programs such as Eden Village, and Warm, and Safe Place, Methodist Home for Children, the Feast Congregation, and Family Promise. We support educational programs such as Communities in Schools, Cape Fear Literacy, and Snipes Academy. We also support health care programs such as the Cape Fear Clinic, the Tides, and Hope Recuperative Care. We also support the Harrelson Center and the Help Hub. And finally, we support Mission of Hope Rotafunk Hospital in Sierra Leone. Our outreach programs led me to join this wonderful congregation almost 10 years ago. And with your financial support, we are able to show our love for all of our neighbors as we are taught through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Second is children. Through your giving, Wrightsville provides amazing opportunities to our youth of all ages, from Sunday school to 412, from Faithful Fifth to Joyful for Jesus, from summer mission trips to vacation Bible school, and the list just goes on and on. As a volunteer with Sunday School and Vacation Bible School, I have been witness to, get to kids big and small who love Jesus and love their families and love their neighbors all around the world and in our own community. Many of your children and grandchildren have been baptized at Wrightsville, and at each baptism we promise to nurture the child who has been sprinkled. Children are the future of this congregation, and it is so very important that the funds are available to continue these valuable programs. And third is music. How many times have you tapped your toes or clapped your hands to the tunes in worship? How many times have you applauded for the exceptional talent displayed by our musicians and singers? Not to mention the children's choirs and handbells, jazz nativity, 4th of July celebration, Easter Sunday, Christmas Eve. I suspect these musical events are dear to your hearts and have become part of the worship tradition of the holidays here at Wrightsville. Music is such a meaningful part of our worship here and its budget is critical. Let's keep the music flowing. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share some of my favorite things about this holy space. I'm guessing that these and many other programs at our church are near to your heart, such as STARS, Bible studies, and adult Sunday school. Please help in continuing to make these programs a part of what makes this church so special to you and me through our generous gifts. Thank you very much. Will you join me now in prayer? Jesus, we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. Thank you for becoming human and dwelling among us and showing us the way of peace. We ask you to be present with those who find peace hard to come by right now. We pray for the homeless, for the hungry, the sick, the lonely, and the hurting. 
Wherever possible, show us how we can be messengers of peace and hope to those in need. We pray for all the families who will be receiving angel tree gifts this year through the Methodist Home for Children. May these gifts be a source of joy and a sign of your love. We pray for our team in Rotafunk, Sierra Leone this week. We pray for the Rotafunk Hospital, for its leaders, and for all the people they serve. We pray also for those who are on our hearts today, and we name them before you now, either silently or with our voices. Jesus, calm our anxious hearts with your loving presence and teach us to walk in the way of peace. And now help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi, Wrightsville kids. I'm wondering how many of you know a baby? Or if you've seen a baby, or maybe you have a little brother or sister who's a baby right now, or who you remember being a little baby. Anyone? Well, even if you don't know a baby right now, you used to be a baby, and I used to be a baby, and your parents used to be babies. Every single person you see every day has once been a baby. So what are some things that babies do? Well, sometimes they smile, but a lot of times they cry. And babies can be really cute, but babies also use diapers. And babies can't really do anything for themselves. Their parents have to feed them and lay them down to sleep. They can't walk yet. They can't ask for anything. <sighs> I think it must be kind of hard to be a baby. You can't do anything for yourself. But as people, all of us have to be babies. But did you know this? God chose to be a baby. This is the season when we celebrate the baby Jesus. And what we mean when we talk about baby Jesus is that God decided to become a human being as Jesus so that he could know exactly what it is to be human and so that we would get to see that we've shared every part of our life with him. The Bible tells us that God loved us so much that Jesus came to be with us and that God didn't use the fact as Jesus that he was God to make himself really fancy and special, but instead said that he wanted to be like us, to be a human. So this year, as we celebrate Christmas, I want you to remember that God chose to be a little baby just to show you how much he loves you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your gift of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you became a little baby to be a fully a part of our world. Help us to become more like you every day. We love you. Amen. Welcome again to The Vine. It's so glad to have you joining us today at Wrightsville United Methodist Church as uh, we worship together. Uh, as you may know, we actually record these services on Thursday nights. And as of Thursday night, uh, Pastor David Haley and the team that went to Sierra Leone has arrived safely in West Africa and they're doing great. And uh, we just want to continue to pray for them. But I uh, want to also uh, remind you as to why Pastor David is not with us in our service today. Our scripture for today comes from Luke chapter 3. And we're going to pick up in verse 2. I'm actually about halfway through the verse, okay? So, um, and then we're going, to, we're going to read for a while. Um, it's a really interesting story about John the Baptist. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? 
In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked, and what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered to all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, Lord, we thank you for the word and especially for the word made flesh. Lord, help us to hear the words of the Bible and to live the word of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. If we gave the following assignment to a kid to write an essay about some famous person like, say, Alexander the Great, I think I could predict how the first sentence would go. So-and-so was born in some year and died in a later year. We adults write the same essays on our tombstones. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 1929 to 1968. The most grounded facts about those we want to know about is when they lived and how long they lived. Knowing when someone lived does give us an immediate handle on some aspects of that individual's life. For instance, a European born in the 4th or 5th century it might make us think about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. The exploits of Kublai Khan may color our thinking when we consider someone born in Asia in the 12th or 13th century. A Native American life lived in the 1500s was way different from the challenges that faced these same indigenous peoples in the 1800s. An African American who was born in the South in 1850 and died in 1910, they lived from slavery to freedom. We consider the birth dates and death dates of individuals to be central to our definition of who they were. That's why the single most basic piece of information chiseled into headstones, that which everyone knows about the deceased, is the date of birth and the date of death. Yet we're so fixated on these two distinct dates that we forget the very most important part of the headstone. That which gives any kind of meaning at all to those dates is what's between the birth date and the death date. I'm talking about the dash. The short dash that lies between birth and death represents what that person actually did with their life. We give short shrift to the longest and most important part of every person's life. It's easy to record when a person was born and when they died. It's much more difficult to record how they lived. That dash crosses over everything we do, all we think, all we feel, all we hope all we dream, over the entire course of our lifetimes. Yet especially in our 21st century high-speed, high-tech lives, a dash is the rate of speed at which we live, not the duration of the meaning that we give our lives. Listen to the voice of a nine-year-old kid as recorded in Time magazine. He said, sometimes I think like, since I'm a kid, I need to enjoy my life, but I don't have time for that. The article is titled, Burning Out at Nine. Wow, even kids are dashing through life, expected to experience and process as much as possible as quickly as possible. But there's probably no time of year so obsessed with dashing as Advent. As soon as the Thanksgiving turkey moves off the table and into the Ziploc bags that go in the fridge, we're dashing off to some 5 a.m. Black Friday sales event at H&M or Belk's where everything is 40% off, but only for the next four hours. The round of special parties, events, plays, preparations keeps us dashing from one scene to another until Christmas morning. 
According to one popular Christmas tune, we keep up this pace, how? By dashing through the snow. We've let Advent become such a hectic dash through time of the year, in part because we've bought into the culture's most basic definition of who we are, of what our lives have to be about. And what culture defines as our basic identity is that we are consumers. With ads aimed at kids from 1 to 92, we are constantly being reaffirmed in our consumer identity from the cradle to the grave. Every day we're bombarded with ads telling us we need whiter teeth or a newer iPhone or a bigger TV. Social media sites even have algorithms to determine what you might like personally. They are targeting you in your ads so that my ads aren't the same as your ads. Just for fun, I checked Facebook to see what they were trying to sell me today. It was a t-shirt that says, I love science. A newly fangled version of the board game Clue, starring the characters from the TV show The Office. And a gym membership to Orange Theory. Gotta say, they know me pretty well. According to consumer culture, the meaning of our lives can be found in the content of our closets, the clutter in our attics, the stockpiles of goods and goodies that litter our living space. But the Bible has a very different standard for success, a very different conveyor of identity. In today's gospel text, John the Baptist challenges those who have crowded about him to hear his message and to receive the baptism that he offers. But John the Baptist's warning to the crowds reveals that he's far more concerned with what comes after his baptism than the baptism itself. You see, if baptism symbolizes a new birth for these people, a new startup date or birth date for their lives, then it's from that moment on that their lives should really begin to count. The baptism isn't the culmination of their faith. Rather, it's the starting point of a faithful life that will be far different from what the world represents. From the waters of his baptism, John proclaims new things must crop out and sprout. The people must now bear fruit worthy of repentance. The prophet isn't concerned with any artificial staff that, excuse me, uh, status that might suggest greatness or guarantees at the end of our lives. Whether one is a child of Abraham or a rich tax collector, or a powerful soldier, their position and power will have no bearing on the judgment that they will face at the end of life. It's actions, fruits, all that a truly rep repentant person does throughout the course of their transformed life. That's what fills the bushel baskets. Only the fruits that are conceived by the Spirit and produced by our hearts will be weighed on the scales of time. You remember a few weeks back when Pastor Julia preached on that passage where Jesus cursed the barren fig tree? Jesus did that because it produced no fruit for a hungry world. The fruitless fig tree had failed to fulfill and inhabit its most basic identity, to conceive figs. Likewise, for all who receive baptism, all who are reborn through the Spirit into righteousness, Fruits of transformation will spring forth. It is basic to who we are. By your fruits, you will know them. Not by the amount of the annual salary you pull in, not by the number of expensive toys you own, not even by how many people attend your church. The question is, are we bearing fruit? Christians are not a culture of consumers. We're a communion of conceivers a partnership of producers. When God instructed us to tend and till the garden at the very beginning, God called us all to conserve what he had created and to continue to conceive what he started. As a people called to bear fruit, we conceive and create. We don't store up and consume. And the ultimate fruit our baptism calls us to conceive is Christ among us. Advent is that time of year when we prepare for the glad tidings of great joy, for unto you is born a Savior. But even more than that, Advent looks forward to the time when into you is born a Savior. Christ is not just born unto us, Christ is meant to be born into us. 
Master Eckhart claimed that all disciples become mothers of Christ, conceivers of Christ's presence and power everywhere in our world. The incarnation is not something that happened only once. As Welsh poet and priest R.S. Thomas put it, the incarnation is not witnessed by only one star in one place at one time, arrested temporarily over a Judaic manger, but by all stars at all times in all places. Within the church, we've grown overly fond of identifying certain people and certain endeavors as missionary. We talk about local missions and foreign missions. We even sent several people from our church with Pastor David to be short-term missionaries in Sierra Leone, West Africa, this past week. But the truth is this. Each one of us is a missionary. Our mission is to be a conceiver from the moment we were baptized. It's through the conception of each new fruit that we incarnate Christ in the midst of our world. If the Protestant Reformation reminded us that there is a priesthood of all believers, then what God is doing today, what some are calling a new Reformation, is reminding us that there is a mission of all believers. The expression of our mission, bringing form to our fruit, should not be mistaken for the mission itself. The fruit of the Spirit may be experienced and expressed in an incalculable number of ways. And not all expressions will be palatable to all people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control find form in a variety of ideas and actions. You know, the opera diva whose exquisite rendition of Aida will send some souls soaring, will send others running for the doors because they don't care for opera at all. A weekend wilderness camping trip with a scout troop would be a heavenly conception for some. For others, it would be a pain in the rear and the back, and the feet, and they'd want to go home just as soon as they arrived. When John F. Kennedy Jr. died in a plane crash back in 1999, his uncle eulogized him with a long list of his good works and impressive accomplishments. He noted, however, that young John had been gifted with many talents, but had sadly not received the gift of years. The dash between his birth date and death date was very short. The gift of years, when it's received, allows us to find new expressions for our mission, new ways to bear fruit as we grow and change. Grandma Moses was discovered and celebrated by the art world when she was in her 80s. But Grandma Moses herself had been expressing beauty in her life from the time she was a little girl through sewing and embroidery. It was only after her fingers stiffened from arthritis and her eyesight grew dim that Grandma Moses replaced her tiny embroidery needle with an easier-to-hold paintbrush. Her mission, incarnating beauty and peace into the world, took on a new expression through painting. But the mission remained unchanged. Howard Finster, a Baptist preacher from Georgia, spent the first 65 years of his life pastoring churches. Not until his seventh decade of living did he begin painting, eventually becoming the most widely displayed artist of the second half of the 20th century. His mission was unchanged, calling people to Christ and witnessing to the glory and grandeur of God. But the form of his conceiving took on a different expression. For a disciple of Jesus, the dash between your birth date and death date is the dash of discipleship. And the identity of a disciple is to be on a mission, conceiving the Prince of Peace for this broken and fallen world. It might change how we do that through the years. Is it still for unto you is born a Savior? Or is the dash of discipleship becoming real? For into you is born a Savior. How will Christ be born in you this Advent? I got to confess, I failed miserably at conceiving Christ in me this past week. After dropping off Everett at Hoggard High School, I often go to the Chick-fil-A on the corner of Oleander and Independence across from the mall. 
Well, one day this week, a guy was walking past the line of cars at the drive-thru, asking us all if we had money for food. It was annoying. Panhandling in line at the drive-thru. I just wanted to listen to Bob and Sherry on the radio and get ready to hear whatever clever thing Jeremiah, the drive-thru guy, would say to me that morning. Really? Does this panhandler know just how much I give to my church and to charities each year? So I kind of blew him off. And then I immediately felt guilty. Can I really not spend $5 so this guy could get a meal? I literally preached the Sunday before how the fires of hell are reserved for those who didn't help the least of these. I totally blew it. The next day, I'm back in the Chick-fil-A drive-thru. The guy asking for money wasn't there. I was just doing my thing. Watching as the two car lines merged into one single file line as the cars went behind the building and waited for their orders. Finally, the driver of the car beside me merged into the single file line. I'm up next. Except the next person in the line beside me jumped ahead. Wait, we've all been waiting our turn, just alternating back and forth. I actually before, ordered before you did, buddy. So what did I do? I honked at him and let him know that it was my turn. And he literally backed up his car so I could have the space. Even though he corrected his course, I was still mad at him for what he did. And then I thought, really? I couldn't just let that go? I couldn't forgive his mistake? Oh, for 2 at the Chick-fil-A this, this week. Must be something about those chicken minis. I think I can do better than that. In fact, I know I can do better than that. I want Christ to be born in me this Advent and Christmas season. I want to be full of grace instead of greed, to have more peace in my heart than pettiness, to be more understanding instead of seeking to be understood. How will Christ be born in you? You know, Christ is born in you when you adopt a family from the angel tree, when you give food to Mother Hubbard's cupboard or nourish and see. But Christ is also born in you when you conceive coaching a Little League team. Or we, you conceive texting or calling an expression of care and concern to someone when it's not even their birthday. Christ is born in you when you conceive an extra measure of patience. Or you forgive someone for their transgression against you. Christ is even born in you when you conceive a smile at someone who darted ahead of you in the drive through line. And Christ is born again, well, I don't know. What comes next? But it's going to be a fun week. To find out what God has in store. May Christ be born in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, we thank you so much for this day and for bringing Jesus into the world. Lord, may our lives be changed by knowing Jesus. May he be born in us this season. Help us to be a little more patient, a little more forgiving, a little more loving, a little more like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We've come now to the point in our service where we have the privilege of sharing together in Holy Communion. If you haven't had a moment yet, go ahead and pause this video and gather some sort of bread and some sort of liquid to join together with us in Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and, and might, heaven, heaven and, and earth are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in, in the, the highest. highest. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, wherever we may be this day. And on these gifts of bread and wine, uh, where, again, wherever we partake, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Pour out, excuse me, by your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to take whatever your bread is. This is the body of Christ broken for you. and take whatever liquid you have in front of you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Hey, just a reminder that our annual cookie walk is this coming Saturday, December 11th. We're super excited about it. It's going to take place at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Um, hope you'll come and be a part of that. You'll get some delicious cookies, and you'll also be raising money for local missions right here in the Wilmington area. But as you go forth this week, think about how Christ could be born in you and how you might express Christ to the world. Go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.